Are we good over there? Yeah, we're good. All right, cool. Well, welcome everybody and mostly YouTube. Uh, <laughs> this is our uh, panel on commentary. Uh, my name is Jay Abs. Let's just do quick introductions here. Uh, Grimelios. I am Covert Muffin. Spike Vachita. I'm Batty. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about talking about video games. And <laughs> did you practice yeah. that? That line? No. Yes, maybe. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> also, we are all super tired. Some of us with like four hours of sleep. Some of us with twenty minutes of sleep. So uh, <laughs> bear with us. Uh, but through you know magic and stuff, I can flip the slide like this. Yeah. Oh my god. Ooh, right. Sexy. All right. So we're gonna teach them how to do that because that was really <laughs> cool. I want to know how to do that. The trick is to hire audience. a Richard. <laughs> Uh, so we're kind of just going to have like not a, a lot of huge sections, but uh, the one the main thing that I think we want to talk about here is there are a lot of different kind of styles that commentary can fall into, uh, and no one style is ever like right for you know one person. You take elements of every style and kind of make it your own, and and that's how you find your own style for commentary and everything. But we did want to go over some of the you know common themes and styles you can find in commentary. Uh, we'll also go over some of the basic do's and don'ts that are can really kind of easily help elevate the commentary game and stuff like that. And then uh, we're going to have some Q&A time for you guys if you want. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and get into the commentary styles. So this first one I'm going to let Muffin kind of start sure. talking about, but I, I like to call it the teacher. Yeah, so a, a lot of speedrunning is about the science of video gaming, right? So when you're going in and finding all these amazing things, finding different ways to apply the controls and mechanics and tech in the game. So uh, in every single performance of speedrunning, you will have to explain something. So uh, getting comfortable with that and going into the explanations are useful. But I also do a lot of strategizing myself with how I organize and present the information. Um, in a lot of my performances, I'm kind of known for doing a lot of like fast-paced explanations and solo commentary for my runs while playing really, really complex games. And oftentimes, you'll find that you don't have enough time uh, or you cannot speak fast enough to be able to explain everything before the run is over. Uh, so some things that I keep in mind that are really important is that you start with a base ground information and then you build off of that through the performance. Just like I did here when I was explaining that to you guys. Started with speed running's complex, right? And then from there I worked into saying you oftentimes don't have enough time to be able to do that. So how do you convey what you're doing, and so the audience can kind of cue into that. Well, you give the base ground of information, and then what am I doing now? Well, I'm building off of that and relating back to the things I just told you guys. Um, so like, for example, in my Warcraft 3 run that I did earlier today, uh, there's an infinite number of things that you can do with uh, micro and macro. So I started off the run with being like, I'm going to control units and do things with them, right? And then later on the run, when uh, things became more visually evident, I pointed those out and then kept tying it back uh, to what I introduced at the beginning of the run. Uh, but you guys can also feel free. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of the way that that can kind of take shape, too, is specifically reiterating things that you have already said, like straight up just repeating something you've said if it's something that's really important and core to the run. So for uh, for example, if you want to talk about like uh, in Crash 3 how a mock tornado works or something, that's something that we use constantly in that run. And so when we first get the skill, like right before I use it, I'm going to explain how it works. But then after a little bit, I might remind people, hey, remember, this is what's difficult about this because it works like this, you know? And so I, I might uh, apply it in a different context, but still effectively repeating the same thing to really drill it in so that way by the 19th time you're doing it, people are like, oh, I understand how this works, you know, and I can follow along. Yeah, I'll also uh, on that note, um, because you don't have enough time to do a full-fledged tutorial, uh, you oftentimes want to target your explanations to the grand majority of the viewers, especially at large viewer bases like uh, Games Done Quick events. 
uh, first of all, like 99% of people will most likely have never seen your speed game before. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a huge majority of that are really unfamiliar with speed running as well. So it's, it's really, really important that you uh, keep things sort of light uh, and keep it more about the, the visual aspect. So uh, talking ahead is really, really important. So you, uh, being like, okay, so I'm gonna show case off something that might look a little bit weird. And then like dropping little introductory notes like that can allow you to draw their eyes. And then uh, af after or like during the fact, you can be like, okay, I'm doing this, this, and this to get this to happen. So I'm doing these things to make this visual thing that you just saw and you can relate to. Um, so like explaining sequence breaks and stuff like that, it's like really powerful to, to set it up in that way. It's also, you need to understand, I, I, I've always been a believer, I worked in theater, you want to assume uh, pretty, that your audience is smarter than uh, I guess you feel like you can like lower yourself down to in some way. Like I assume my audience, everybody in here knows what an iframe is. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like I have to like reiterate what exactly. Shut up, idiot! <laughs> uh, Shouts to Knox. No, uh, is on that they all understand what that is. So I'm not going to stop and explain exactly what that is. I'll also think about how I want to try to be a teacher. Like you said, you want to try to explain to them a little bit of almost how to do it without getting into great detail and realize what the visual is on screen. So like we've got Kingdom Hearts coming up later on in the day. Very easily that could just turn into somebody watching that game. You know, the game can be a little simple in its mechanics. Like, oh, you just jump and attack something until something dies. <clears throat> but you take a fight, say, like, Jafar, and that looks like another fight where you just kind of jump and attack. It's okay if you guys don't know what it is. You guys have probably seen Aladdin. It doesn't matter. But there are actually a lot of instances where you'll be able to see the runner today. He's going to move in very specific positions. So I'm going to want to try to explain to you guys why is that. I've always been a believer in make your audience smarter, yeah. which is the point of, you know, we're calling this the teacher. So I want to make you better at whatever subject we're working on at the moment. So the reason why he's going to be moving over here in a second is because it's going to manipulate this boss to move in a different position, which is going to allow us to do this. You also want to think to yourself how you're building up to that. Yes. To not reiterate something that just happened. Because right. then it's gone. You don't have that visual on screen. To be like, I don't even know what he's talking about anymore. So, okay, I, I, I kind of zone out as opposed to. So, in the upcoming battle or this upcoming level in this platforming game or whatever, uh, I'm going to be doing this and it's going to look like this. And then you actually get that visual representation of what it is. And then you as the commentator, I think, have done a lot more to give your audience a chance to not just be like, ooh, that's pretty and cool what just happened, to actually have some understanding and context of why that happened. Yeah, and that's actually like a really good and critical point that Spike brought up is that after you sort of explain something once, um, the, the audience, like people who are watching later will go and see like another boss fight or something and see the runner like getting into specific spots and stuff. And they're gonna be like, oh, that person, they just did mm -hmm. that thing. And that was really cool. And they'll uh, be able to relate relate to that and and celebrate that with the, the runner. Yep. Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say um, to sort of piggyback off of that, you could also be very explicit about that observation process. So. Absolutely what Spike and Muffin and everyone else has said about making sure that you prep viewers before you get somewhere, but then when you get there, and this is sort of a tie into the next section too, you give almost a bit of play-by-play. -play. Mm -hmm. So you say, in this fight, I need to get up high and then do three attacks, and these are made-up examples. And then you get there and you say, all right, and here we are, jump up high, can we get the attacks, bam, and then everyone applauds. As my voice sort of cracks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, It is yeah. early. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one of the best results of kind of doing this style is when you feel like you didn't explain something and the audience ends up following along anyways because you've led them up to that point uh, to where they're now able to know, oh, I'm going to be looking at the health bar in the top right and you know during these fights if I don't understand what's going on or I'm going to be you know, paying attention to how many jumps he uses here or something if you've only got three or something in this specific scenario. And I can tell, oh, he got a refresh by landing on the ground there. Like when you feel like you've built up enough to a point where people can can take can like kind of figure out what happened without you reiterating it, that's like the best result you can have out of it, I think. Right. Uh, anybody I, got anything else on that? I'll, I'll say one more thing to uh, 
maybe look at that with a different spin is it's always easy, easy to watch speedruns of a game that you're intimately familiar with because you can appreciate all the ridiculous tech and how much people are skipping. I think that one of the primary goals of this sort of style of teacher informative commentary is trying to take viewers who have never seen your game before and get them not to that point, but closer to that point mm -hmm. over the course of the run. So they won't know everything, but they'll be able to appreciate why what you're doing is impressive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One more note off that. Like I, I drew a lot of influence with how I structured and strategized with uh, informative commentary by watching lots and lots of different uh, runners and different styles. And it, that, that was really helpful. But yeah, I'm good to. I have nothing to add because I don't think I've taught anyone anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's I you okay. lean in. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> I have nothing. <laughs> uh, the last thing I'll say too is that this can kind of sometimes even be twisted into like a um, stream of consciousness, which uh, the best example I can possibly give for this is the Catherine run that happened this morning. Like go back and watch that run later. If you're watching this on YouTube, like go find that run right now because that is someone teaching you how to think about the game um, mm -hmm. rather than specifically what's happening on screen because sometimes it is pretty straightforward what's happening. So the stream of consciousness is another way of kind of saying, look, this is how I'm thinking about the game. All I'm doing is saying my inner thoughts and now you're learning how I think about it and therefore you'll be able to think about it as well. Um, and that's just kind of a little twist you can kind of put on it. Yeah, I guess oh, one more note, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is oftentimes you think like people who are doing informative commentary are like thinking of the things in the moment that they're explaining, but a lot of these things are just like in the back of my mind and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start talking about this and I just let my mouth go while I'm focusing more on the gameplay. So like, pra we're gonna t talk about this later on mm -hmm. too, but practice, 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 practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next thing we wanna get into, uh, Spike and I really love to call the dumb guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And because of that, I'm going to let Spike champion this section. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> no, no uh, it, it's, not, it's not as bad as you think. Whoa, 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 with the, like, <laughs> whoa. You do not have to be dumb to be the dumb guy. <laughs> yeah. um, so nice. the basis of dumb guy, I remember Mike Uyama and I, I feel like we're the first two who kind of dubbed it the dumb guy. And it's someone, you know, it kind of started off in early GDQs where there weren't, you know, thousands, literally, of people who come to these GDQs. It was you know, a couple dozen people. You know, this started off 2010 in uh, Classic Games Done Quick in Mike Uyama's mother's basement. There were, like, 20 people there. So a lot of times you would have the runner was the only person at the event who had any idea what was going on in the run. But you did usually have somebody else who would volunteer to be the dumb guy. And that's someone who sits on the couch with you and just asks questions and what you effectively are is the audience's voice up there because you're probably all out in the audience everyone's watched a speed run where we didn't explain something where we just kind of let something go by and it didn't matter i remember once watching early on a Mega Man x speed run that was at a gdq and one thing was sort of taken for granted in it that uh if you dash when you shoot your lemon in Mega Man x it actually does double damage and they never explained that at the beginning. And I'm not like talking crap on, you know, the people who were doing commentary. They time. suck. They <laughs> were talking. <laughs> it's just something you kind of take for granted after playing the game for thousands of hours. Um, so all of a sudden, I remember like, you know, me and one other guy were like two or three rows back. We were being rude about it. We were saying, hey, do you want to explain why that's the case? And they went more into it. So that was actually an example there of an instance where me and this other guy, we knew what it was, but we acted like we didn't effectively. We were the dumb guy. It's not about you know acting whether you did it or not, but uh, we were the dumb guy being that voice for the audience, asking those questions that maybe not everyone's gonna understand. Um, so a lot of times you can almost be like a support to, I think a lot of times to a runner when they don't have anyone else. I've seen hosts do it. I've seen a couple of couches, even in recent memory, I think it was a Burnout Paradise maybe last year, who he had nobody on his couch. So all of a sudden you started having like one random person came up there, like the host, started asking him questions about the run. And before you know it, it just livened up the commentary quite a bit more. It gets conversation going. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great tool for both... Uh, you know, kind of building credibility to a runner. Like like Spike was saying, if you already know the answer to the question and 
and you basically want to make the runner look better because as commentators, that's kind of your job, uh, both to instruct the audience and also just make the people that are playing the game look good, uh, then you can ask a question that you know the answer to knowing that they know the answer to it and they'll answer it. And so it adds credibility to them. And then also, like he's saying, if somebody is nervous, it builds their confidence as well right. so that you might not have to ask the next question. You know, they'll just jump in and start talking about it. So especially if you know that you're that, uh, like, for example, you get a run in somewhere and you know that you're going to be really nervous, having somebody there just to bounce off of for questions can be really helpful. Yeah, like uh, last night for the prey run by Lifelike, I was the dumb guy on <laughs> on the couch for that. Um, Blood Thunder, who is also mic'd up, did any percent and ran it a bunch, but they just had me there. And I, uh, when you're doing the dumb guy as well, it's uh, I think it's you guys can disagree or agree, but uh, I think it's also important to try and match the energy of the runner. Yeah. Like Lifelike is sure. really, really like uh, soft spoken, both in uh, tone and just in, in general. Uh, and so I, I wasn't Wah! like super intense. You're like not making the show about you all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I was able to, to prop him and like, uh, cause I met with him before the run and I was like grilling him with questions in private practice room beforehand to, to get an understanding. And so even though I knew the answer to every single question, it was just like, yo, should we, uh, could you tell me more about this? Or like, oh, that, that clip looked impressive that the audience just saw. Can you like, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you also get a kind of bonus side effect if uh, if you're playing the dumb guy and you truly are the dumb guy when it comes to that that run and you have never seen it before or anything, then you can kind of really get this nice bonus side effect of actually being having genuinely amazing reactions <laughs> yeah. like on mic. For example, I played the dumb guy for Iconoclast at, at Calathon recently, and I had never seen the run yet, or at least not that category. And so I was sitting there and just wild things were, would happen every now and then. I was just genuinely reacting because I was surprised at how amazing it was. So it's, it can be really nice to have that little twist on it sometimes. Yeah, I like the point made. I think Spikey made this about just creating a dialogue with the runner. You know, if you're running a game at, well, if you're running a game in general, but especially something like a GDQ, you know your run. You probably know a lot about it, and it feels good to talk about stuff that you know. Mm -hmm. And probably. so if you can just help ask questions, especially if someone's nervous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably. You, I didn't hear what you said, but I said probably. You said probably. Said probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, cool. Uh, I think that's basically the, the dumb guy. Anybody have anything to add? I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> What are we talking about again at this event? <laughs> Patty demonstrating how the dumb guy can also be the comedic relief. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty good. And now uh, we, I wanted to do something kind of special with this. Uh, so we've gathered a couple oh, yeah. clips that, that we, uh, the people commentating the clips that you're going to see throughout this panel, they have not, they've seen the clips because they know the game, but they have not seen what we chose. So uh, specifically here, Muffin is going to be commentating a clip of Jedi Knight, uh, Jedi Academy, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in which he will kind of play the informative role because he knows a lot about that. And Spike is gonna play the dumb guy because he knows nothing about this run. I have series. never seen this, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Muffin, you can either explain it as you're, as if you are the one doing it or you can explain it, you know. Okay, so based on I, the I video can like either way. start off giving a few details and then you can like come into try yeah. and progress conversation and then we'll yeah, of course. go from there. Okay. But we thought it'd be fun to do some, you know, live commentary and stuff we weren't ready for. So hope you guys enjoy. <laughs> There'll be no audio on this, by the way, just there will be on some of them, but. Oh boy, okay. Yeah, so here's gonna showcase off vehicles which are going to be extremely broken. So here I'm gonna be building a good bit of speed by turning the bike and trying to get into a specific spot. Yeah, there we go, okay, and the setup. Uh, I'm trying to knock myself up the mountain here, but it's not really working. Okay, I got up there. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's actually, are you controlling both yourself and the bike at that point once you're off of it? Yeah, so I'm basically just going to be setting the speed with the bike and then using my force power, which is force rage, to keep myself from going under health. And then the bike literally just goes through this animation so it continuously reapplies the speed each time. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I think that's pretty good on that, but uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Well done. Oh, good. 
So you can see, even in a simple, you know, 20 second, 30 second clip or whatever, uh, Muffin used some of those those techniques that we were talking about. He got to the basics. I'm going to be driving a vehicle and then getting off that vehicle. And then he built on that and said, you know, I'm going to be actually using it in order to get a skip. And then I'm going to be doing that by moving into this position and stuff like that. And then Spike waited for a good opportunity to get some clarifying questions on when, you know, how exactly are you dealing with the bike? Are you setting its position ahead of time or whatever? Or you're controlling it once you're off it. So, right. Yeah, there's kind of a number of questions you can go into as the dumb guy. That, like, I thought if that wasn't the if it clip had kept going on, I might have asked something just as simple as, what is this thing on the UI? Yep. What is this thing that the audience is going to see the entire time that the the uh, maybe the runners don't ever think about? But it's something that, like, all right, I'm being forced to look at this Wiimote on the Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword for five hours. What the heck's going on? <laughs> yeah. So having that clarification, I think, is something just really appeasing to the audience, I believe. Yeah, and also something that came, like, hit me just now is that uh, with informative commentary, it's easy to talk over the action and you don't really want that to happen. You wanna let the, the action be the wow moment for the audience because that's what they're going to be keying in there. So I was like trying to just give base details and I knew when the bike hit me and the character went really high to get up onto the mountain, I knew that's what the audience was going to key into. Uh -oh. So I so I wanted to, so that's why I started like grunting and being like, am I gonna get it here? And then after the wow moment happened, that opened us up to keep the informative commentary. Sure. And you normally have game sound effects and you know yeah. music and stuff too to help yeah. enhance that moment. Was that from your actual GDQ one? It uh, looks it's identical. From my PB, actually. <laughs> was it really? <laughs> yeah, nice. It yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's oh, go ahead and one, one quick yeah, thing. Yeah. As an added perk on a almost a more practical level. Uh, Muffin, you're someone who can talk a lot, and you're sort of loud. <laughs> and so, and so, and I, I, I say these things as compliments. And so, in a scenario like that, especially when you're going to be both playing the game and doing hardcore commentary, just having something like Spike interjected gives you a second to to rest, take a oh, breath. Oh yeah, breathing gets sure. a different voice in there. So I mean, it's yeah. you know net positives. Yeah, and that's something in general I like to just, if you ever uh, get to be a runner at a GDQ, think about if you do have a couch, use them. Mm -hmm. And don't ever make yourself end up being like, I'm going to talk nonstop for an hour or however long you're doesn't work is. well. But it I doesn't want work to. Well. But right. Hattie, Unless it just, really serves your run to do that. Like, yeah, yeah, but it's tough. I, I do remember a specific run that, uh, and I don't want to say what the run was. It was years ago. But it was a very long run, and the runner talked the entire time. <laughs> like, it was no, he had four people on his couch, and he, they, none of them ever got to talk. Um, and it was one of those where, after a while, it just, I don't care how much you love any of our specific voices, if any of us just talk to you guys for, like, three hours without ever breaking it yeah. up with yeah. anybody else, that, just after a while, I get bored of listening to it. I want some different quality of a voice talking to me after a while. So finding that where you can ask questions and have this dialogue back and forth, it also just makes it seem like, oh, there's a lot of people who care about this, yeah. not just the one person talking to you the whole time. Yeah, I'm sorry, you... Spike, what were you saying? I wasn't listening. Shut up, <laughs> And you can, you can also use the host and donations to do that. Interacting with donation comments is a good way to, to like add those breaks, as Spike was mentioning. Uh, well, I could see that. I can, yeah. Yeah. Not if they're ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the, the good hosts know how to jump on. Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's the host. Always ready to go. Yeah, it's the host's job to, to be ready for those. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to the next, like, style here. Uh, I put this up here as the sportscasters, which uh, Grim and I are going to talk about um, mainly at first. And this is kind of your, like, <clears throat> uh, for lack of a better term, your hype esports style kind of thing, which is probably my favorite kind to do. And uh, it pretty much only serves races or games that are so, like, intense in action that they might as well be a race. Mm -hmm. uh, but... It is, it, it kind of is the style that most uh, closely emulates traditional sports, right? So even with the style, it, it doesn't exactly fit into this uh, these roles, but you can have a play-by-play -play person and a color commentator or a, uh, an analyst during a speed run, you know, which is not something you generally think about. This especially works well for tournaments. Um, I mean, tournaments are great because you can educate early on, you can kind of play that informative role. 
and then later on in the tournament, you know that your core audience has already been watching so much that they have learned all the basics, and you can really get to dive deep into the play-by-play -play and the analysis side. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about analysis first, because I think yeah. that's probably the closer one. It's actually a good uh, segue. I was about yeah. to say, just to be you know crystal clear, we should define exactly what we mean by play-by-play -play in color. So play-by-play -play basically being you're going to watch the screen, and you're going to essentially do John Madden commentary and just say, this is happening, and now this is happening, and now this is happening, ideally you know, with practice in a way that kind of flows well versus the more analytical side, which uh, let's let's look at the notes because you summed it up very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're very prepared here. We're totally prepared. <laughs> and we're also totally awake. We're very tired. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but the analytical side is, well, exactly as the name says, it's more analytical. You go more in depth. So rather than just what is physically happening on screen, you talk about the effects in the run. Okay, so that set him back a minute and he's going to have to come back. Plus now his cycles are off. That's analytical. You say, well, with that death, and I guess we are talking about races too. So um, with that death, he's still in the lead, but a uh, much closer gap now. So he's going to be forced to go for this frame perfect trick at the end or risk being you know, clinched, uh, clinched out of his victory at the last second, which means that he might get nervous and choke. That's very valuable information and very, very relevant to the race. So that's sort of the more analytical side. There's there's a lot that you could analyze about any any speed game or runner, I suppose. Oh, yeah, you can talk about the effects that that has, like the, the actual immediate effects that that has on the run, like Grim said, with cycles and stuff like that, or maybe you now don't have some bonus health because you died or something like that. Uh, or you can talk about the mindset of the runner. You can talk about the psychological game, especially in races. This I will harp on it over and over again. This style best fits races. Um, and you can talk about, like, okay, well, he's got to be a lot more nervous than he was before, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll also point out that, um, you know, hopefully... All of you here, uh, we have more people than I thought we were going to have, dude. Dude, yeah, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, or, or for anyone watching later, I think it's important to understand, you know, if you understand the fundamentals of play-by-play -play and color, these are not two buckets that you must fit into perfectly. You know, any good commentator will be able to sort of slide around both, or it could be somewhere in between. But as Hobbs has been saying, it, to go with the sports analogy, it just ends up being a nice sort of delineation of roles, yeah. which is convenient for swapping back and forth, especially if you have a... Two commentators. It, it's always nice to know, like, okay, who's going to be the primary play-by-play -play person, the primary color person, and then you just shift as you need to, you know, depending on how the race is going. Uh, so to get into a little bit more about what play-by-play -play is, as Grim mentioned, it's talking about the action directly as it's happening on the screen, uh, but you also do kind of a lot smaller, subtle things that can really help out. Like, you can change your, your vocal patterns a bit to really kind of clue the audience into what the state of the race is like. So if I'm starting around here and I'm going to be talking like this and then suddenly my uh, speech pattern starts getting faster and now, oh my God, I'm incredibly excited because these two are suddenly super close. I cannot believe how unbelievable, you know, you just do that kind of thing. <laughs> so that you can really tell like it's, it gets really close. Um, the race gets really close there. So you can use things like that to your advantage as the play-by-play -play person without really confusing people at all because I'm not saying anything more technical about the the run i might be saying oh my god they're going to be walking to the right and jumping and then yes that's correct they're using using a double jump you know like I, we're talking about real basic stuff here sometimes that you're actually describing and sometimes yeah. it's more complicated stuff but you've built up to that point throughout the run and just straight up you're kind of the hype man at that point right yeah. like you're trying to keep sure. um you know just keep everybody excited and invested in the race and even if the race is not very close, you want to kind of follow that same tone, that same pattern, and really then your exciting moments become when there are opportunities for failure from the person in the lead or opportunities to catch up from the person that's uh, behind. Yeah, this is like one of my, this is probably my favorite uh, aspect of this commentary and something we talked a lot about for the Ori four-way race. Us three were the commentators for the AGDQ Ori four-way race. Um, it is controlling energy uh going going into it so like there's going to be certain parts where you're going to be ex explaining stuff <laughs> and uh w when you're doing that you're, you don't want to be like and yeah this mechanic is like you do this this and oh wow skippy this cutscene is opening the ability menu oh my goodness right it's, you're, you're not have you ever it. pressed an a button <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it, it doesn't work but like you can like explain the things and then you can plan out those hype moments and uh, 
And then as you're getting closer, you can like build tension. And so as Hobbes mentioned, there's lots of different things you can do with your voice. But if you're somebody who doesn't have these inflections and whatnot, um, you can practice them. And that's definitely something I would suggest and advise. But then also what you can do is just end up changing your phrasing, right? So like if you want to start building tension, you actually just start to stress certain parts of the run and, and then as you're getting to the point of hype, you can start bringing your up your pitch up and then start getting really excited and oh my goodness, he's going for it and wow, he gets it for, right. And yeah. so you, you can do that to and play around with the energy and that's the thing that I, I love most. It's so much fun. Yeah. It doesn't have to be overdone, you know, if you don't feel right. comfortable yeah. being as energetic as some of these <laughs> lovely people here. Uh, like you said, you can practice and you can improve. Like I know uh, for that, uh, Ori four-way race, basically Hobbs and Muffin played primarily play-by-play -play roles, and I was more color. Again, it's a fuzzy line, but that's sort of what the the, the roles were. Um, and I feel like since then, I've certainly taken what you guys did and tried to get better at play-by-play. -play. So it's, you know, there's not one correct way to do it, but these are very good rules of thumb, I think. Faster speech, slightly louder. Don't start screaming like, yeah. unless you really want to, I guess. You only start screaming if you have earned the you know, earned getting to that point, sure, right? Yeah. Like if that race has been so unbelievably close and you have just followed the action, you've kept everybody up to date the, and the stakes are high, like that's when you can get to that point, but you need to feel like you've earned it uh, mm. up, up to that point. Yeah, in theater, we always talked about in, when you're on stage, if you ever take a pause on stage, that you sort of have what they, get, they call pause nickels and you only have so many nickels to spend during the course of a play. If you spend them yeah. all the time, after a while, it's just... <laughs> Okay, just go. Like, there you, you get tired of it. You don't want to listen to it anymore. But if you use them very, you know, where they kind of need to be or where they've earned to be, all of a sudden it's a lot more interesting. It's the same sort of thing here. If you earn those really hype moments where you are genuinely invested in the race getting closer or a runner nailing a frame perfect trick or whatever it might be, all of a sudden the audience is much more willing to go there with you. Sometimes they happen a lot more often. Hobbs and I have done a lot of race commentary together, and sometimes you'll have a week or two where we'll do commentary for, you know, an event we do. Uh, that's just, it's just the races are kind of chill, and it's fine. We don't have to force any moments there. Other times we're screaming for three hours. Right, and so. that's where you can kind of fall into the, like, where play-by-play -play can apply to a single screen or can apply to a, a single race. If you know that there's a very technical portion of a run that is – a lot of, especially if it's accompanied by a lot of movement on screen, then that's a great place to play by play. Like uh, during the um, Crash 3 run I did at AGDQ last, last event, uh, I actually asked Spike, I said, hey, when I'm doing some of these hob sledding levels, I have to focus and things are gonna move really fast. True. So if you kind of can just play by play and say, uh, he's going to be slide, spin, jump, and then slide again immediately. He has to do this with a frame buffer instead of actually, you know, na nailing it on the right frame and stuff. And then he has a two-frame window to get this slide, spin, slide, spin, and saying that as it's happening on screen. That kind of thing can can still work out in in uh, single player runs and stuff too. Well, I mean, it ties back to the teacher thing right at the beginning, right? You know your speed run, so you know where the hype moments are. And if you see the commentator getting excited and physically sitting up and getting excited, you know that something's about to happen. <laughs> Even if you don't completely get it as the audience, you're like, oh, okay, I guess we're going. You know something's <laughs> happening. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, well, we got another clip here. Uh, this one, Grim and I are going to commentate. So uh, Grim's going to more or less play the oh, God, color Tara. role here. Tara, if you watch us back. <laughs> And lurking assassins here, okay. Yeah. Uh, so Tara's gonna play like the color role here and I'm gonna play the play-by-play. -play. We have no idea what we're about to see other than the fact that it's Ori in the Blind Forest. Wait, you're play-by-play? -play? Yes. Okay, yeah. just wanted to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess, here, here we go. All right, so we're heading down towards the double jump tree here. There's going to be a very specific trick coming up on the right, Grim. That's right. So this trick is called the uh, Grotto Early Cyclist. An eight-second time save. Tara's going to do some precise movement, try to get inside, and that's very valuable. Excellently done. I mean, that just saved him eight seconds over Lurking Assassin, who takes an intentional death on the left. He's going to be moving, jumping around these spikes, trying to dodge around. Does a nice job there. Tara on the right side, taking intentional damage to set up for his next ghost door trick. Here it is, going to be dodging right through that animation. That's that's right, and this is very important. We are still early in the race, a lot of very dangerous sections to go yet, but lurking on his end missed that trick that Tara got to, which means that although Tara's still in second place, did gain eight seconds back, so it's only eight seconds, but that's certainly something. 
Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's pretty good yeah. place to sound there. Lurking, I'm sorry, I, I assumed you missed it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he was showing, he showed at the beginning of the clip. Oh, did he? Oh, I missed it. <laughs> did you really? So a big thing there, and we hadn't actually talked to about it yet, and I think it's more applicable to races more than anything else, race commentary, is I've always been a believer in guiding the yeah. audience's eye. So you saw it, like, th in just that, like, little 20-second clip, there were two or three times where uh, both of them said, now, if you look at the right side of your screen. Yeah, saying the racer's name, saying the runner's name is not enough. Like, yeah. um, only people who already know these runners are going to immediately internalize Tara's on the right, Lurking's on the left. Like, you have right. to actually say on the right side or the left side. Yeah, because if you just say Tara with an amazing play, the first thing the audience's eye is going to look for, which one was Tara? <laughs> They're going to like, especially if there's four on screen, is that okay? And by the time you find that, it's probably already gone by. So definitely finding that area where, again, we're wanting to like build that commentary and build that narrative before it happens. Always tell them, all right, look to the right side of the screen or the top right part of your screen or whatever it might be because this big moment is coming up. Now they're specifically getting to focus on that as opposed to this just kind of blur of movement, like especially in a fast-paced game like Ori can be. Um, just where I need to go. And that's also where the play-by-play -play comes in handy because the, as the play-by-play, -play, well, as actually just commentators in general, you're going to watch both screens. You're going to, like, keep your eyes on both screens. So you tell everyone where to look, and then if something wild happens where they're not looking on the other screen, that's where your play-by-play -play cuts in and, you know, says, like, oh, man, a big death just happened on the left side, and then people immediately switch their their focus, right? And so you can really try to kind of balance that line and it, it's a lot about guiding the eye for sure. That's something we talked about a lot. It does take practice to get in the habit of mm -hmm. directing people's eyes, but it's incredibly helpful. And this is only two people. If you're dealing with a three or four way race, you obviously say top left, bottom right, whatever and it might be. this is honestly like a slower portion of the game too. <laughs> like, oh, right. thank yeah. you, thank you. Y'all hadn't for found any of the powers yet. I thought we were gonna pull up Star Bash or something. I, I dude, I thought for sure we were going to Valley, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, cool. Well, we'll, we'll uh, move on for now. Uh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah okay. uh, one more note is that oh, no. if you, when, when you're not actively on the mic, be thinking of what to say next and mm -hmm. be watching both both of the runners. Because oftentimes the active mic will only be talking about one of the runners, but they might look to you for a quick note of confirmation. So it's it's really one of the hardest parts of sports casting commentary is both listening to your fellow commentator, watching all of the runners, and then being ready for the next thing to say. So um, it, I think that's one of the things I've I had to practice the most when I started show casting stuff. Yeah, you better watch a lot of your game because it yeah. needs to be like second nature to yeah. see that something different happened. Yeah. The, the only other thing I'm going to add to that, there's a lot of fun when you have a good rapport with someone like yeah. Hobbs and Grimm there, that there was just this moment where Hobbs, instead of, he could have kept talking about what was going on, but he just kind of alley-ooped it up for Grimm right there. Pass the potato. Yep, exactly. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> he said pass the potato. Oh, pass the potato. Yeah, pass the I potato. Thought, so, like, here's the potato. <laughs> my brain hurt. The potato was yours now. My brain heard, ask the potato. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah. The potato knows potato. all. <laughs> so the next role we're going to talk about is the potato. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, that leads in quite nicely to our <laughs> next style of commentary, the comedian. <laughs> this is Patty's time to shine. <laughs> I'm here to teach you how to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so... The comedian is basically, uh, you know, trying to make people laugh during a speech. If you keep doing that, Knox, I'm going to come over there and <laughs> slap you. <laughs> is he being an idiot back then? He is being an so idiot, cute. very visibly. Um, I love you. Basically trying to make people laugh during the speed run because all of these styles, generally speaking, on their own are very cut and dry. Here's the video game. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what you can do. Here's why it happens, et cetera, et cetera. The comedic style kind of breaks that up and actually, you know, makes people smile, which is nice. Um, and for me, when I'm on a couch commentating, it generally becomes the only style. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm a little overbearing, admittedly, when it comes to being the comedian role, but uh, you can kind of sprinkle it in a little bit if you're doing a speed run, either the runner or your couch. And it's really easy. You can use a whole bunch of different things, misdirection, um, sarcasm, anything like that. I like to call it um, setting the table and kicking the legs out or 
in other words, lying. <laughs> <laughs> lying works really well, where um, you can go and, like, say you're going into a stage and you're about to do something really wonky and skip the entire thing. You can be like, uh, yeah, this is, you know, this is a normal stage. Uh, probably have time for donations, and then you skip the whole thing. All right, thank you very much for that donation. <laughs> <laughs> so stuff like that. Um, it's really down to your own style, obviously. Everyone has a different sense of humor. Everyone has different ways of making people laugh. Um, you can play off your friends. Uh, a lot of There are different styles in terms of just what you do commentary-wise to uh, be the comedian. You can, um, the way I do it is I generally make fun of whoever's doing the speed run. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, if I talk about the gameplay, it's in the context of the runner being trash. <laughs> so, um, for instance, I get a lot of recognition for making fun of Andy, if you guys know who Andy it's is. It's in the description of the panel. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So um, it's really easy to make fun of that idiot because I'm friends with him. Um, that's an, another big thing is it's super easy to um, do the comedic role if you know your couch well. <laughs> Obviously, it doesn't happen all the time, and you can still do things like be sarcastic. Even as the dumb guy, you can you can be like, oh, that looked like that was supposed to happen. <laughs> like, it's little things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really comes down to kind of basically taking a break from the the analytics, the strategies, the everything speedrun related, basically, and just jarring away from that suddenly, and just the complete juxtaposition of that is generally what makes people laugh when it comes to watching speedrun, speedrun commentary. Yeah, the uh, you can end up sort of finding by, like, I think to the link to the past run you guys did, maybe, like, two, like, there was... I don't know, there was a lot of ad Every year. It was, a, it was a solo run that Andy did that you were on the couch where yeah. that Ribbed Killer was on commentary or was on a host for. Yeah. And a lot of what Patty got to do was he kind of almost got to sit back and allow the run and, you know, kind of the seriousness of the commentary to come down and people are, you know, being analytical up there to kind of see almost what the story of this run is from the outside perspective watching it, that there was some theme about potatoes or something. I literally made one potato pun and it's haunted me for years. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, people start coming in with donation comments about potato puns uh, for a while, and you just sort of lean into that <laughs> and allow yourself to... Because there's a little bit of an understanding of, all right, it's linked to the past, We've seen it many times. And even if there are a lot of new audience members and they're still having fun with that and just giving that lighthearted energy to it. Um, you know, you did the style where you can kind of make fun of it to find comedy. Right. You can also have a style of comedy where it's just simply, I did a commentary yesterday morning for a Silver Grapple. My, my good friend Ivan did. He asked me to be on the couch for it. I had never seen the game before. He showed me it for like 15 minutes the day before. And there's just simply this little movement in it where you grapple and you just go whoop. You just like zip across the screen. You're supposed to you're supposed to grapple walls. Certain walls are grappleable, and then you swing. But the game has a grapple button. Yeah. But you can also use the joystick to grapple. Right. And someone at some point did both at the same time. And if you do both of them, you just grapple away. <laughs> <laughs> the game thinks you're grappling the wall on just the complete edge right. of the entire screen. So you just zip <laughs> through the whole level. It's ridiculous. So my kind of style of comedy, of bringing comic relief to the run, was it just to break up the commentary a little bit and kind of fill in dead zones. Wasn't necessarily me making fun of Ivan right there, but sort of, and not even really making fun of the game, just laughing at how ridiculous it looks to watch this little character go, whoop! Just like it's outrageous. Right across He's the a little cartoon guy that goes like 70 million miles yeah. per hour. It's <laughs> crazy. And that's a big part of, I mean, comedy is probably the most broad style like that we've, we're talking about here. I mean, we could you could have three panels on. <laughs> well, actually, there's been like thousands of panels over the course of decades and hundreds of years, actually, about comedy. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but specifically about speed running and stuff, like there's still so many different ways to, to add comedy. And sometimes the game is kind of your comedian for you and you're just sure, really right. speaking for the game. <laughs> Awful block exists. Yeah, like exactly. that's kind of what that's there you could for. Be the, you could be the driest person ever and play just a horrible, <laughs> awful game. Yeah. And 
imagine just the most ridiculously horrible game and the person doing the speed run is like doing the teacher for it. <laughs> like teach, teaching you like all these strategies and getting super deep into the science of like this Atari game that three people have played. Right. <laughs> so it's it it really it can be anything. It yeah. can, it can really be any, it can be your gameplay even. The game could be normal, you could be, you know, not the funniest commentator ever and then you could just have just funny gameplay quips in there. Like I know a guy who's super dry, super good at video games. He does Aladdin speedruns. His name's Hulk. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. there's a auto scroller level and in the middle of this like super like this dude's got robot hands it's crazy the <laughs> speed runs amazing and he's going through it there's no commentary there's no microphone and then in the auto scroller there's a part where you it's just this big flat nothing and you just got to wait for it to go and he starts dancing with the character to the music <laughs> <laughs> and it's like in the middle of this super high execution world record speed run and he's just making a latin like duck to the music <laughs> And it's hilarious. <laughs> it's things like there's so many things you can do. Yeah, and it's all about finding your own style. As as with all of these, like it's it's about combining elements. But especially with the the kind of comedic style. I mean, y you watch a run that uh, where Patty's on the couch or something. You, uh, it's going to be pretty different from watching. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be pretty different from watching like PJ and Mecha Richter, and it's going to be different from watching Author Blues and Bracentia. Sure. Like, it, it's different from person to person, and I I really like. There's actually a great like Scrubs quote for anybody who's familiar with Scrubs. Oh yeah. Uh, about how everybody is hilarious. You just have to find sure. what makes you know where that hilarity comes from for you, and uh, I think that applies to speed runs too. It's sometimes it's the game that's hilarious. Sometimes it's it's you, and it's, mm -hmm. sometimes it's the situation. Yeah, like Patty said, like you'll have you know just loud people, like say you know a couple of us here on stage. You have other people. They find they find that humor you know in being very very dry or just in moving the little character around. So no one has to feel like oh, okay to be funny, I need to be this. And like I said, you could talk a thousand years about like how to like be funny, but like there's something in all of us where you know. Just if nothing else, just I'm laughing at Superman on screen. I'm laughing right. at Superman 64 yeah. and just the ridiculousness <laughs> of that game. Yeah, I th I think like an, another good point that we've been uh, hinting at and like getting to is that experiment. Like just try many different types of comedy until you find your own. Like here I have this half page is just filled with potential memes that I could have brought up in my performance. <laughs> And I maybe got through like half of them and like one of them were really funny. And then mo like the grand majority of them just kind of either flew over people's heads or they, they didn't laugh. But uh, like my own style, I guess, because we were people were talking about their own is like I say really silly things or really stupid things and come up with like catchphrases and, and words like take a bath or douche monger or uh, you got a yellow card or truche. Yeah. Yeah. A monger like, of douches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Legend has it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> These are all mine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> Just sounds like a mafia role. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I drew the douche manga. <laughs> um, Do you have any powers? No. Yeah. I claim douche manga. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Douchemonger, what did you so do you in the see night? see here how you can <laughs> yeah. sort of break it up a little bit. All right, Muffin. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're, no, we're no. I, th that was basically it. But then also, um, I'm really energetic and stuff, and I laugh at pretty much everything anyway. So even if things aren't funny, I, I end up laughing. And so uh, it's important also to sort of balance out your energy with the type of comedic style you're doing. So, like, for example, I probably... I may or may not be on Patty's couch. Like if they, you're not. They, no. no. <laughs> 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 See. <laughs> The, this the, is not because it's early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's a no, through line to, to all of this, which is that if you're friends with the people that are on yes. your couch, yeah. it's really easy because, like, I don't consider myself a naturally very funny person, but paired with you know, some people that I'm really friends with, you can sort of crap on each other a little bit and it can be a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, you really need to like watch some of the Ori tournament that we just had oh, because God. Grim and Tara <laughs> just had this like long running line for weeks, months. It's still that going. Would, they would just like completely make fun of the other person. Like they, they, they would say, uh, <clears throat> they like they, 
Tara would not be playing the game, right? It'd be two completely different people. It might be me and Vulagen, <laughs> and uh, I'd mess something up, and Grim <laughs> would just say something like, ooh, j Hobbs having a rough time with Starbash there, but not as rough as the worst Starbash that's ever happened, which is held by Tara, who actually took <laughs> 499 <laughs> attempts at Starbash. You know, like, there's so many different ways to do the comedian, and one of the other things I, I know that you do that I really like is uh, you like to refer to other things other people have done, too. Like, I remember when you did Salt and Sanctuary, you talked oh, about yeah. how I brought up in my run, or I brought up in some commentary that ladders are slow and they suck, and then you used them to go really fast. So yeah. you kind of balance, you know, both the aspect of the game mechanics being funny and ref, you know referencing something else. So real quick within the context, one, one last thing before we get. I think Q and A is next. If we, uh, we got one more thing before that. But we yeah. do. Okay, never mind. So uh, one last thing oh, in the context of GDQ commentary. Um, Playing off the donations can be big because generally speaking, we're all here doing speed runs, commentary, all this to raise money for charity and to get people to give up their clams for charity. So um, playing off of the donations because in the middle of the run, the host is hopefully going to read some donations that happen during the run. It's always super awkward. It's, we have time for donations. <laughs> we don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> that's 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 what you get when you stay up till five a.m. regularly and you can watch the stream. <laughs> <laughs> that like, yikes! Uh, but, um, if you're lucky enough to have people donate during one of your runs that you're commentating for or you're doing a run, um, playing off of the donations can be big. Like uh, at one point, I was doing commentary and someone donated it was like a no comment donation it was we have twenty dollars from secretly a raptor thank you secretly a raptor and i just said well, not anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that was good so it's it's important to kind of recognize donations because it incentivizes people to donate and hopefully get their comment read so that maybe something happens that's like that on stream. So. They get their moment to shine now. Exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. exactly. All right, uh, I guess the last thing to say about that before we go into another clip here is uh, that the comedic role is the best one to embrace when a run is going south. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> if, if your run Abandoned is, ship. If your run is tanking, you better make it funny because that's going to make it so much better overall. And it's also going to loosen you up if you're the one actually running and stuff. Uh, and that also helps with the donation thing, you know, that Patty was saying, like the Burnout Paradise run that Spike brought up, like the donation reader read a donation wrong and brought in like $30,000 in yeah. the middle of the night for running Burnout Paradise because he read one donation wrong and instead of like ignoring it, he leaned in. Uh, so it's really great to just embrace that and lean in when a run is going south or even just you make a small mistake. Uh, all right, so let's move on to the next clip. So this one is going to be Spike is going to be commentating as if he's playing. Just kind of you know do your normal thing or whatever. Sure. And uh, we're just we're just gonna let Patty do his thing. <laughs> Yay! Uh, so this is Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. All right, so yeah, sorry guys, We've, uh, this run's been a little rough. It's uh, you know I'm a little uh, rusty, but that's okay. All right, we're gonna be uh, heading all the way through here. So, okay. I didn't know they put a character model of you in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, gonna be coming up on this section right here. This level is at least pretty easy, so let me see if I remember how to do this section. I think I end up. Oh wait, no. Oh, oh, I, okay. I'm just gonna let that die. Okay. Um, wow. Sorry about that right there. Hey, you're doing great, man. <laughs> <laughs> most pe most people die there, so. <laughs> You know, I swear, I, I played this game a couple thousand times. All right, so I just. Uh, no, I, I have. That wasn't right. I, um, it's all right, man. This was an actual tournament match. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I get this time. I think I'm supposed to bop off of the first L. Oh, nope. Okay. Well, <laughs> hey, you know what? We're here for you. <laughs> Me and the hundreds of thousands of people watching you do this right now are all here for you. Hey, do you believe in me on this one? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need that. All right. Thank yeah, seemed pretty good. <laughs> I went on to win that match. <laughs> <laughs> no, he <it> didn't. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, that's pretty much what we had for the styles. We're going to move into a little bit quicker section, just some kind of do's and don'ts. Uh, we'll have some of them on screen. We're going to say mention a lot more, and we'll probably be looking at notes a lot more for these as well. But uh, basically just some general tips that are really 
some some of them are really big, some of them are really small, but they will all help you like elevate your commentary game uh, almost instantly if you if you start following them. So we could kind of just pick these randomly. The uh, first one I'll pick, I'll, I'm gonna like pick because it's probably the biggest takeaway from this entire panel is practice, 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 and practice, and practice, and practice, and practice. Like just do commentary, you know, even if you're not doing it for anyone, like just load up runs and do commentary. Like it, it just helps so much more when you practice, uh, like more than anything else. I think. I think that, uh, when I say this, I think you'll all agree with me. I've always viewed uh, commentary, especially for a big marathon event, something like GDQ as something that you have to practice along with the run. Like, not that you have to do super hardcore, realistic commentary every single time you play the video game, but, you know, have a number of your attempts commentating, including things like, we now have time for donations. The reason is that you practice the run so that you can do it second nature if you're nervous. And if you do the same with commentary, then it's that much easier because it becomes second nature as well. Yeah, and practice doesn't always mean doing the same thing every time either, you know, especially with the comedy bit. Like, practice might mean getting in a, in a group call with your friends and just, like messing around while you're racing like it, it practice comes in all forms or just streaming yeah i'm sure yeah. a lot of you just stream if you're thinking about doing speed runs or you do do speed runs you stream like practice just falls into doing your speed run and talking about it on stream you don't have to like all right i need to take two hours to practice my commentary today you can just you know turn on the stream and talk yeah People yeah i grab like other ones. I, another sort of a uh, different way of practicing that you might not have thought of is make a tutorial. Oh, yeah. Uh, making Sorry. a tutorial is, is really, really good, especially if you want to do informative or shoutcasting because it gets you into the mindset of explaining things and, uh, and having that be really visceral for the viewers. Yeah, another thing I like to think about in practice, when you're doing some of these speed runs and things, like, there's a million things you can maybe explain about something that happens in a 30-second level. But if you explain all of those, it's all just going to be a wash. Everyone's going to forget everything. So take, say, if you're playing through, like, maybe Sonic the Hedgehog or something. All right, this first IL or individual level that is 20 seconds long, what is the thing I want the audience walking away from. Maybe it's in the first level. Maybe it's a you know a basic mechanic of the theme that's going to follow all the way throughout the run. Maybe it is one specific trick that's going to happen that I want everyone to hold on to. So thinking about that as opposed to just rattling as fast as you can through everything and mm -hmm. it all just mm -hmm. completely goes over their head. Right. Spike actually like really hit on one of the don'ts there right away, which is don't use you know acronyms or phrases or jargon without context. Because he said right there, uh, you know, maybe you're looking at a Sonic the Hedgehog IL, uh, IL being individual level. You know, he very quickly explained that, making sure that he, that everyone was on the same page, you know, just giving context to that acronym. So now he could use it for the rest of the run if it were a run. And obviously sure. it's just commentary. But yeah, that's, that's a very easy don't that um, really elevates things. Yeah, and I really like the, so, something else Spike just brought up with that same example. is like you have 30 seconds and so um, oftentimes one of the most difficult things to do is explain things ahead of time, right? So this is an absolute do for, for all forms of commentary, uh, except for maybe comedy, because comedy is kind of after the fact. But just like setting up the audience for what to see, and then you say something about it, thing happens, and then you can reflect afterwards. But during that reflection period, you do not want to be uh, sort of telling the audience what, what they're seeing. So don't tell them what they just saw, tell them what they're about to see. So I'm a little confused. Um, you just assume everyone knows what iframes are, but not ILs. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was so gonna give him crap about that earlier. I'm not even. Lying. I was waiting for this slide. <laughs> Does anyone here not know what an iframe is? You can be honest. Oh, we actually do. Oh, okay. okay, we do have some. Yeah. So they, hey, there's me. Yeah. But that's okay because every time I come to frames. Spike and he says iframes, <laughs> I say is... invulnerability frames. <laughs> you know. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Invincibility. Or invincibility. It's the same thing. Yeah. I'll fight you. <laughs> oh. Now they're fighting instead of me. Right. <laughs> Grim, you want to throw one out? I had a thought, and I totally forgot it, so back to you, Hob. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, probably one of my favorite, like, simple things you can do that I feel like not enough people do uh, is watch back your runs. Watch back your commentary. First of all, if God, you think no. it went... 
<laughs> that's, that's the thing. A lot, uh, I think a lot of people would actually fight me on this one because some people really hate like hearing their voice. Well, that's, yeah, that's kind I of the point, it. right? Right. That's, that's my point with it is if you hate hearing your voice, just keep listening to it, and then eventually you'll get used to it. You'll get desensitized yeah. to it. And yeah. You know, as you uh, but <laughs> for me, I, I find that one of the easiest things I can do, especially if I thought a run went well, I can watch my commentary and like get a little ego boost. But at the same time, sure. I can try to like pick out my flaws from something that I thought went really well. Uh, but also, just watching them, watching back in general is really easy to do. Like you did a run <clears throat> for a tournament, an online tournament or something, and you're like, okay, I need to go get some dinner. Put the run on that you just that you just did while you're you know, while you're getting some dinner or something like, or the, rather the run you just commentated, you can listen back to it and see like, okay, what went well there? Ooh, I, I really liked how I explained this seg segment. Let me kind of remember that for the future. Ooh, but this part where the lead change happened, I felt like I wasn't excited enough about it or something like that. And you can really, you know, learn a lot from that. And, and don't base whether you liked your commentary or not off of like, let me go watch a Twitch VOD and see what the chat said. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, 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 the chat. GDQ run. Like, there's a, I, there's I, a don't for you. Don't bother with Twitch chat for the right. most part. <laughs> don't actually, read the comments. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't do it. That's so easy for someone in there. I know everybody here, we're familiar with how the internet works, but there's such an easy, like... There you go, making assumptions about our audience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to throw this douche comment into the void and no one's going to see it, but, yeah. like, man, that, that douche comment sticks out when they know when you know it's uh, talking about you as you're on that cruise. So make sure it's always something that makes you happy and screw everyone else. Yeah. So. yeah. I remember what, uh, what I was going to say before, but now it's sort of too late. Do it. Maybe I'll say it anyway. Do it. On the topic of uh, prepping people in advance, generally speaking, very good rule. You know, so you explain this is what's about to happen and then it happens. The exception is sometimes it can be very effective to say, all right, I'm just going to do something and it's going to look ridiculous. Yes. And you just let it happen and then explain it. But even there, you still prep people for yeah. the fact that yeah. something, they're going to see something and it's not going to make any sense if you know you have time afterwards to explain it. Like a, a really good example in Ori and the Blind Forest is there's something called the Kuro cutscene skip. Mm -hmm. It's this super thin like vertical cutscene trigger that you can skip. And if you do it correctly, it just looks like you stopped for a second and then continued like, why nothing happened. And it's like, yeah, exactly, that's the point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I mean, that even goes back to what like uh, Patty was saying about how sometimes you'd prep into a level that you know is ridiculous and you prep in saying, yeah, so this level is not going to be hard at all. You know, it's not going to be wonky. I did wonky. say that. I remember that. Now. Yeah. So that even there, you know, even though you're really setting yourself up for a joke, you're still setting yourself up for the joke. You're getting everybody to pay a little bit more attention or maybe a little less attention in order to be wowed, you know, and it, it's... Oh, you missed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th this is also, like, a really, really good point is uh, if, if you feel like you cannot explain something for the audience to take something away useful you can oftentimes turn that into a comedic event. Like with the when me and Spike were doing the shoutcasting thing with the, the speeder bike, like in the beginning, I could have just not explained something, and then we could have turned that into like a comedic thing. Like, uh, what happened? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think happened. that commonly takes the form of, what are you don't worry about, about it. Yeah. So, so we're going to go on a casual drive normal. here. and Yeah. 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 Um, another one of the don'ts that you're seeing up there, don't get hung up. Uh, on mistakes and also don't be afraid to improvise these kind of go hand in hand a little bit but uh, mainly if you make a mistake just like either like lean in and acknowledge it and and make make fun of yourself for it or something but if you make one that's not going to be a, gr a great thing to kind of riff off of then just whatever you made a mistake just move on like it's a live event every single commentary you do is live unless you're recording a video and you're doing multiple tracks in which case it's not really the same thing so yeah is there is there a panel after ours? Yeah, there is. I think we got probably like oh. five more minutes or something before. Yeah, we'll we'll move on to questions probably. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah. just a last note: don't don't expect things to go perfectly according to plan. If you're somebody who really wants to plan out commentary, like I have a, I have a, I have a very big plan for my commentary, like every single my performance. God. But it, it never it never follows the script directly. We wrote a four page outline for the uh, the Ori and the Blind Forest four way yeah. race. Oh yeah, knowing we weren't going to reference it like during it, but just yeah. just so that we'd have a plan. And right. then Muffin got sick, yeah. <laughs> and so I had full blown GD flu during that. Yeah, and so we were like, all right, hey, let's let's get loopy. Let's see what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So he just <laughs> improvised some jokes in the middle of it. You know, even though we were talking this super hype four way race that we were doing play by play and informative and color. You know, like it it was. It doesn't always go according to plan. Yeah.
All right. Well, uh, yeah. So in conclusion, guys, uh, just the biggest thing I could take, I, I would say, is find your style by practicing. Do mm -hmm. a lot of practice, uh, whether it be streaming, whether it be you know actually commentating a run, uh, commentating a run that you're currently performing, or one that you you know just grab a video for or something like that. Um, find out elements that you like. Watch other people that you really think are really better commentators than you, or you really like their style and stuff. Watch a lot of people. I mean, I watch so many commentators, yeah. both in traditional sports and yes, uh, esports and in speed running and stuff. So. It, I try to like kind of blend the styles and the elements that I really like into into my own thing, um, and practice and practice and practice and practice. Start and flapping practice those gabs. It. Yeah. Woo. All right. Uh, so with that, if anybody's got any questions, oh, wow, wow, immediately. All right. Didn't <laughs> even finish. All right, cool. His sentence. Uh, I think I saw your hand first, so we're gonna repeat any question that you guys ask, just so that it's in the recording and stuff. But yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, That's a so good question. First, first off, the question was uh, when you're commentating a race where the, can, the result is basically decided long before the end, uh, maybe somebody is finished or they're several minutes ahead or something like that, uh, how can you kind of keep that not boring? How can you keep it kind of exciting and stuff still? I'm a believer in at the end of the day, then just break it down as you basically have two simultaneous speed runs mm -hmm. going on at the same time that, yeah, okay, the race has this gap, but we can now break it down to now we're just watching two solo runs and I hope they hit everything. I think a lot of times we can fall into this bad rut in speed run races where we're really just rooting for the person in first place to die somewhere so that it becomes a close race again. <laughs> When in reality, it's like, okay, I'm watching this person in first place. I hope they nail this final boss strat. Okay, he's going to be coming up on this final boss strat. Okay, it looks like he executed. Woo, all right. Now let's shift our focus over to the second place person right. and see if they are able to do the same thing with it. A big thing with that is to not only focus on the person that's in front. If mm -hmm. you, if mm. they're, Obviously, they're going to be doing all the speed tricks and all the hard things that you want to talk about, the talking points with the person in, in first place that's mm -hmm. doing them first. You're going to talk about them. But don't neglect the person behind. And even though you've talked about what the person in first has done, the person in second or third, when they get to those tricks, kind of like gloss over the same thing you said. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's, for them. It's especially good because now everybody who missed your ex explanation the first time has a second chance to look at it. Or if they did see it the first time, now they can see if they're going to understand what you said right, and if right. they're going to have a better understanding of that trick or something. Some of the coolest moments, I think, in, like, three, four-person races, like a GDQs, are when, like, there's this really, really hard trick, and, oh, the first person hit it, oh, the second person hit it, all of a sudden, like, all four of them end up hitting it afterwards, and the audience pops off. Mm. It's like when you're with your friends and you're bowling, and all four of you strike in that frame. <laughs> That's the most exciting part yeah. of the night. It's not when just you hit the strike. Right. Yeah, yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, aspects of, of racing as well and I call this points of contention so yes. you want to draw their eyes to a singular trick and then make sure you guide them to each each runner as as they get to their part yeah uh, another great thing you can do is if PB potential is still on the line like actually especially in tournaments no like getting data like knowing what the PBs are of both the people racing, knowing what the world record is, you know, how close are they to each other, how close are they to, you know, world record or whatever. Uh, have they been grinding out a certain segment and therefore they're likely to save some time in that segment over the other person? That kind of thing can really help. Um, and the PB potential may still be alive even after the race is already won by one person. And so that is a nice and easy little, like, way to still root for them. I mean, you're effectively rooting for them to nail everything, to have a clean finish at the end. Yeah. And if none of that works, comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Just make fun. Have fun with it. Magic. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question. I think I saw you. Yeah, before.
No, there's merit to it for sure. If yeah. you feel like you can do your run on your own and you don't need commentary or you don't need someone to bounce off of and you feel like you can talk about the run and be either informative or entertaining or both on your own, then yeah, sure, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I, nothing I, here. Sorry to interrupt. I did a run my first GDQ when it was, I had people on the couch, but I was the only one mic'd up. It was at like five in the morning. I played Goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> You know. So I mean, it was it was fun. I had a good time. I was the only one talking, and I don't know. It's it's totally. There's definitely merit to it for sure, or there's not merit to it, and I'm I, a jackass. No. Yeah, we we don't have the like all the the rules either here. You know, these are just like kind of some guidelines that we've learned along the way and stuff like that. So it all comes down to you do you, boo boo. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was gonna say, like Muffin, just in your run this event, you did all the commentary yourself, but you still had friends just for moral support. Um, and so purely from a commentary perspective, yeah, there's absolutely merit. There's no rule that states you must have X many people. But you better be ready for that, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned Right. You say uh, screw you. Well, hold, hold on. I need to. I need to make sure I repeat this question because we forgot for the last one. Uh, yeah. So the question was basically, uh, what happens when you just spent a long time explaining something and somebody new pops into the chat and they ask, uh, "Hey, what's this thing you're doing?" You know, and especially if that happens 19 times in a row, you know, uh, it's again, it's kind of up to the person. I know Kizron really likes to just like immediately go why would you ask me that i just you know it, <laughs> as a joke and immediately like just start having fun with them but then he'll get into the explanation uh but you also just that's kind of the nature of streaming um as opposed to like a recorded video is you better be ready for saying the same things over and over I, and saying finding different ways to say them is a is a great way to kind of make it a little more fun like Okay, well, I just spent 20 minutes explaining that. How can I do it in five this time? How can I do it in and four seconds? Moobot commands. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Actually, though, commands, really. If you get the question a lot, just make a command, and then your, your chat can just exclamation, stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, just this paragraph that you prepared, and Ex hopefully it's in there somewhere. And you exclamation can just rando, and put that in your title, and, yeah. and people will still ask it. They won't read the title. Trust maybe if you have mods that can also answer that question. And be understanding, though, that, like, I just came in. I might not notice that stuff right off the bat, but, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Uh, yeah. We should repeat the question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when things start really going south in a run, what kind of what kind of things can you do to really salvage the commentary? And I'm gonna let Patty do what he just did a second ago again. What did I do? All right. <laughs> comedy. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, comedy. If you're not doing comedy, but if you're doing comedy and you suck at it, then switch it up to a different style. Yeah. Really just change it up is really what cool. it comes down to. If what you're doing, you feel like it's not working, do something else. Just change it. Because if it's not working and you change it, either it's going to continue not working and it's not going to change anything, or it's going to work and then it'll be better and more entertaining and better watch, all that. And you're saying specifically if something happens poorly in the run, not necessarily in your commentary? I just want to clarify that. Either or. Um, sure. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah. Okay, so the example was the SMB3 race last who night. Who which... would ever stomp on <laughs> yeah. a stage and reset <laughs> someone's console? I can't believe anybody would ever do that. Uh, so Never happened before. I mean, let, you can actually look at that as a great example of what to do. Like, uh, first off, Graham Puber wanted to make it immediately clear to everybody accidents happen. You know, it was an accident and he yeah. felt awful about it. But then he leaned in, you know, he's like, okay, well, he, you can't do these things. Let's find out how are we going to do this route to keep it fair. You know, I'm not going to use items that you don't have and stuff. And so they, they made the dialogue about that. And I asked him, because I actually interviewed uh, both runners after that, and I asked, uh, Grand Puber, I was like, hey, are you 
cool with me bringing this up because I feel like it might be a little weird if we don't stuff. And he was, he was like, it's going to sting today, but lean in. Like, it's going to be way better because it, it, that's how it works, right? Like, it, it may feel bad in the moment, but if you lean into it, that is always going to be the better option. Um, you're, then you own it and you get to make it your own. At the end of the day, we're all playing video games out here. And of course, yeah, we've all sunk, you know, <laughs> depending on the game, <laughs> four hours if it's Titanic. But other games, <laughs> thousands, of, <laughs> thousands of hours. Yeah. But like at the end of the day, mistakes happen. Yeah. You got to improv. You got to have a good time with it. And everyone's ready to laugh and be there and be supportive. And if they're not, screw them. So whatever. Yeah, right. I, th I think the one note I'll also add is that um, it's very important to just distinguish between a PB attempt and a performance. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, like I, t I take intentional time losses in all my performances to show off more things and make things a little bit more visceral. But then also if like things end up going south, it can be like, okay, yeah, it's a marathon performance. And then just like uh, try and get your mind ba back on track and then just keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. All right, we got time for one more question. So I picked like so many of them, so somebody else picked. Uh, I don't want to choose. <laughs> uh, You're in the front. Go. Yeah. <laughs> I love you all. How much does body language play in the commentary? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. That's interesting. So the question was, how much does body language play into commentary? That, I mean, first of all, none if you don't have a webcam. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to wear pants if you don't have a webcam. <laughs> I'll leave that one. Do you think that's limited to <laughs> Please not wear pants. a webcam? <laughs> uh, I don't but know. If you're at a GDQ. <laughs> Body language is, is a great tool that you can utilize. I think I'd, I'd phrase it that way. Like you can, uh, I, I personally in interviews and other stuff like that and just in commentary in general, I like, I like using my, my hands, use my arms to have some extra motion, really kind of give an added feel. <laughs> Other Does the people lack like of body language moments. change the commentary? <laughs> <laughs> or is it still funny? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know, like, I think one of, uh, one of my favorite things from, I believe, is a GDQ thing. If not, it was just, like, a highlight from your stream, Patty. But, like, Patty, at one point, I think, just got up, put his headset down, and walked off the couch when, it, <laughs> when his comment came in. I don't want to be there anymore. <laughs> so it's Potato a tool you can use. I mean, it, worst case, like, you've got the, the gameplay is the main focus, right? So worst case, if you're not really comfortable in your body language, then whatever. Like, people are going to watch the game. But it, it's a tool you can use to really kind of just liven things up a bit more and, and kind of enhance it. I'd also say just do what feels comfortable. You yeah. have enough on your plate doing runs and commentating to, <laughs> to not obsess about think, how you're oh sitting. God, am I sitting up straight? Am I? Yeah. Yeah. As long as you have pants on, you're probably. Right. <laughs> I will Please say, wear pants. It, <laughs> I will say if you run a uh, DS or 3DS game, please try to play off your capture if you can. I know it's not always going to happen. It's not always something you can do because of like input delay and all that. But if you can, play off your capture feed because then your head's not looking down like this and you're not really, you know, looking like you're that engaged even though you really are and uh, it, you just kind of got to do the whole thing looking down you like okay, this huh? and yeah. it really seems like you're just having a bad day. Yeah. Uh, As opposed to just standing up here. Oh man, I speed run 3DS games. <laughs> well, I think with that, uh, they're probably going to kick us off so now you guys can all stay for the panel that you were actually trying to stay here for, right? <laughs> We're sure you all had the times wrong. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, and thank you to Richard. Oh, yeah. He I set meant up to our shout shows. out. Richard is awesome, and he's going to hide. Hiding. But Richard, like, made this, the awesome slides for us and stuff and was controlling it during the whole time. Richard so. can do anything. Thanks, Richard. Hire yeah, yourself thanks, a Richard. Love you, Richard. Love you. Love you.